Well, turn with me, if you would, to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 12. And we come once again today to the third of the three main sections of the book of Romans. If you remember in Romans 1 to 8, we saw the gospel analyzed. In Romans 9 to 11, really the gospel nationalized. And now in Romans 12 to 16, we're seeing the gospel realized or actualized in our own lives. After 11 chapters of doctrine, Paul moves on to application. And the question is, what difference does all of this make? How do you actualize the gospel in real life? How do you walk the talk? Two weeks ago in Romans 12.1, we saw that it has to do with responding to the mercies of God, to God's compassion, and responding to his compassion in a particular way, responding to his compassion through what we called our consecration. We saw how it goes from consecration to, really, ignition, where Paul says, I beseech you, this is Romans 12:1, brethren, by the mercies of God to present your bodies, that's consecration, a living sacrifice, that's ignition. We saw that the mark of someone who's really connected with God's mercy is a flaming life, where you become like a superb meteor, as Jack London said, every atom of you in magnificent glow, which is what glorification will be, where you say, in light of all that you've done for me, take my life and let it be, like we sang, consecrated, Lord, to thee. The mark of the one who's been moved by God's mercy is first a flaming life. But second, today, it's a transformed lifestyle. We saw last time that for a flaming life, you need a kind of a spirit-empowered will as you let go of what's life to you, like God calls us to do again and again, as you let go of what's life to you for the sake of one who gave his life for you. We put something on the altar, what's life to us? Give him something to burn, to, to consecrate, to ignite. Uh, now, they obviously overlap, but fundamentally, transformation, sanctification comes from a, 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 a spirit-empowered will. And transformation this week comes from a spirit-enlightened mind. Because in the very next verse, our verse for today, another famous one, in Romans 12, 2, Paul goes on to say this, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Transformation, be transformed, he says, by the renewing of your mind. In Romans 8, Paul laid the foundation for this doctrinally when he talked about setting our minds, if you remember, on the things of the Spirit. We saw it's a miracle mindset that can now make a miracle of our lives. So, having looked at the miracle mindset doctrinally in Romans 8, today we'll look at the miracle mindset practically, where the rubber meets the road in Romans 12 as we actualize the gospel in our lives. And to tee it up, I like to pick up on the same story that I told you about back then in Romans 8 about the traveling salesman. Remember the one who's in the road in the middle of nowhere and he gets a flat and it's in the dark and on top of that he, doesn't, he discovers he doesn't have a jack and so he looks around and he sees this farmhouse in the distance and there's a light on and he sets off but as he walks towards it, his mind starts to churn like it so easily happens to all of us. What if no one comes to the door? What if they don't have a jack? What if the guy won't lend me a jack even if he has one? And the more he thinks, the more worked up he becomes until the door opens and he punches the guy out and he says, remember, keep your lousy, yeah, keep your lousy jack. That about says it all in terms of what we're going to be talking about today. Today we're going to see the secret of transformation as I've titled this message. And to put it in a nutshell, we're going to see that as Solomon said in Proverbs 2, it's all through scripture, but in Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks, yeah, and thinks in her heart, so is he or she. And so be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
This applies on many different le levels, just to get you ready for what we're going to be talking about by way of application. I, I, I told some of you that after my first father died back when I was six years old, I found myself withdrawing from people. I became a recluse of a little boy, and that went on into my early adulthood. It got to the place where I could hardly stand to be with anyone for, you know, even three or four minutes without this almost irresistible uh, impulse to leave. It wasn't until my late teens and early 20s, after years of wondering why I was this way, why I couldn't change, that I came to see something. And that is uh, an unhealthy pattern of thinking under my unhealthy pattern of acting, one that went way back to the age of six. Because at that age, you don't fully understand death. Maybe some of you experienced this in different ways at an early age. I knew he had died, but I felt like he had abandoned me, that he had just up and left. So there must have been something wrong with me. And so from then on, when anyone would ever try to get close, I started to think, if I let this go on for very long, they're going to find out what's wrong with me too, and soon they'll be out of here just like he was, and I'm no fool, and so before that happens again, I'm out of here when it comes to relating to anyone. It was just a feeling, but those were the thoughts. I really believed those thoughts, so, though I never really put them to words until later on. And so I became a dark, a, a depressed, a withdrawn little boy. Because why? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. More on that later. Hold that thought. A lot of people like that out there. Maybe in here. These days, maybe more than ever, still controlled by something in their past. And it's for this and many other reasons that Romans 12, 2 is one of the best loved verses in all of Scripture. Because it shows how to find your freedom from that kind of slavery. Slavery to the world around you, or to the flesh within you, or to the fears within you, or whatever. How to find freedom from sin and to become all that he wants you to be. The main idea of this classic verse is simple, but it's very profound. It's the secret of changing for the better, at least a good part of it. And it doesn't have to do with right living. That's putting the cart before the horse. No, Christianity is about real change, the real change that happens from the inside out. And that has to do beginning with right thinking. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind, because as a man thinks in his heart. So is he. You'll find this taught all through scripture, both in the New and the Old Testaments. This is a tip of the iceberg verse. And it's important to understand just how deep and wide this teaching goes, to just how important it is, this teaching on the incredible power of the truth if we get it into our thinking, of thinking the right thoughts. Because obviously, if what we think is so important, it might be good to start by stopping to think about this teaching on thinking. <laughs> to really let it sink in, sink in, to lay the foundation for transformed living before we then go on to look at what it looks like in real life. So such verses are all over the place in Scripture because God wants this to sink in to our thinking. So let that happen as I read them. Joshua 1.8, this book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall what? Meditate on it day and night. And what will that make possible? That you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. Meditate on it. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Psalm 119.33, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall observe it unto the end. Give me understanding that I may observe your law and keep it with all my heart, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Colossians 1.9, Paul prays that we'd be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding so that you may then walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, bearing fruit in every good work. It's cause and effect. 2 Peter 1, 2, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. And how do you connect with his grace and peace in a multiplied way? May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let it sink in. 2 Peter 1, 3, seeing that his divine power has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness 
And how do we connect with that power? What's the secret of living a godly life? Seeing that his divine power has given to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who calls us. And then one chapter later he says, we escape the defilements of the world. That is, we avoid being conformed to this world. Rather, we're transformed. We escape the defilements of the world by the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ephesians 14, until we all attain, attain to the knowledge of the Son of Man. And what's the result? Next word, to a mature man or woman. Back in Romans 8, Paul talked about those who walk according to the flesh, according to their sinful desires. And why do they do it? Romans 8, 5. Those who are according to the flesh set their, what? Minds on the things of the flesh. But those who walk according to the Spirit out there, in here, set their minds on the things of the Spirit. How do you stop committing sin? How do you free yourself from that slavery? What's the secret of finding freedom from sin? John 8, 31, famous verse, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin, but you shall know the truth, and the truth is what will set you free. Can't do it on your own. So what are you thinking about? It's like Christ says in John 15, 19, out of, the how, out of the heart come evil thoughts. And what do they turn into? Out of the heart come evil thoughts. And then the very next word, he goes into deeds. Murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, that's lying, slanders. Notice how he, Christ skips from thinking to doing without skipping a beat, without a word in between. Because once you think it, he wants you to know, it's almost as good as doing it. That's how seriously we're to take our thought life. Or at least that's how seriously Christ takes it. That's why Paul said in Romans 13, 14, do not even think about how to gratify the flesh. Another translation is give no thought, not a single one, to the flesh in regard to its lusts. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Paul says we're to take every famous verse, take every thought captive. To the obedience of Christ. Why? Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Deep, deep teaching all through Scripture. According to Scripture, it's cause and effect. Your thoughts determine your deeds. It's mind over matter. It's monkey think, monkey do. And so we need to be very, very careful what we allow ourselves to think. It's central to how we become better people through the power of the gospel by the renewing of our minds. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So often, you know, we let our minds get away with murder. And then we wonder why we end up losing it. <laughs> why did I get so angry? Why am I so depressed? Why did I, you know, have to go to that internet site last night? Question, what was going on in your mind in the hours and in the days before the temptation. All too often, the resolve to resist a temptation comes long after it's too late. And it just pours out through what we've been thinking. So how do we renew our minds? What does it look like when you get the rubber on the road? It sounds good in theory, and clearly it's a huge scriptural priority, but how does it work out in practice? Well, it's very simple, and it all boils down to two things. It has to do with saturating our minds and then just as importantly it has to do with selecting our thoughts. Saturating our minds and selecting our thoughts. It's, it's about saturating your mind year after year and it's about selecting your thoughts moment by moment. First it's a process. Under it all, the process of transformation, of sanctification, is a process of saturation. Is it any wonder why so many Christians in America are so conformed to the world, given what they're saturating their minds with? Given what they're meditating on day and night through, through the internet, through TV, through computer games, and all the rest? And what, 
when it's this book of the law that Paul, that, that, that the scripture says we're to be meditating on day and night. And what does that look like? Well, as many of you know through your own experience, we meditate on God's word in our daily devotions and during Sunday sermons, hopefully. <laughs> And in Sunday school and in Bible study groups. And that's why our first value as a church is that we want to be saturated. We want to be biblically grounded, as we call it. And that's getting more and more rare these days. If that's what you want, you've come to the right church. When so many Christians are filled with the culture, in part because so many churches are not filled with the Scripture. And so we want to be biblically grounded, as our value says, standing on God's truth in dependence on his spirit, reading, studying, teaching, and obeying the Bible as our foundation. This is the number one issue of the church in America. Not church growth in numbers, but church growth in depth, where we are a mile wide and an inch, inch, and an inch deep. And fundamentally, it's because there's cultural saturation, not biblical saturation, with meditation for the sake of long-term transformation. What we're talking about today is, is, is slow, <laughs> It's as slow but sure, you know, as a good diet. Unlike all the other diets that are out there, this one works. It's the word that causes us to grow up. The meat and the milk of the word, as the scripture teaches. Peter says it's like meat and milk when it comes to spiritual nourishment. It's a miracle diet when it comes to spiritual growth. And it has the reverse effect of food, if you're patient. When you eat normal food, you know, your body digests it and it changes into you, unfortunately, into more and more of you. <laughs> and so you end up growing more of yourself. <laughs> but, but when you take in the word of God and chew it uh, slowly and savor it lovingly, and then you swallow it deeply, slowly but surely, it digests you. You grow to be more and more like him. It almost goes without saying, you become more like the Lord of the word through the word of the Lord. It's like Augustine said, he was imagining once that his Bible was speaking to him. And he said, the Bible said, I am the food of grown men and women. Feed upon me and you will grow. But I will not be changed into you like ordinary food. No, rather you will be changed into me. I love that. It's much like what happens when you eat a healthy diet because it's a slow process and so people get discouraged easily. And you don't always notice that much difference day by day or even week to week. But without it, you'll end up pretty malnourished and eventually you're going to starve to death. And that applies not just to hearing the word, but in reading and studying and memorizing the word year after year. Renewing your mind is a long-term process that will have, yes, an incremental, but it's an inexorable impact over time. And what does it look like? Well, to get the rubber really on the road, the cookies at the lowest shelf, it looks like what it did for Charles Malik. My father had a close friend who worked with some of our nation's leaders with Campus Crusade uh, in Washington, D.C. back in the 70s. His name was Drew Sawin, and he ended up traveling the world with Dr. Charles Malik. In May of 77, my father wrote me this letter while he was in Singapore. He said, Dear Brian, here's part of a letter I recently received from Jew Drew Sawin in Washington, D.C. Here's what Drew said. The greatest privilege and experience for me this past year was time spent with Dr. Charles Malik of Lebanon, former president of the United Nations General Assembly, president of the Security Council, and without question, one of the greatest Christian statesmen of this century. Dr. Malik, a founder of the United Nations and author of the Declaration of Human Rights, has held, every, uh, has held key leadership responsibilities than mo uh, during most of the crises of the last 40 years. He was president of the Security Council during the Korean invasion and again during the Hungarian uprising right up through the various crises in the Mideast. 
Most of October, November, and December was spent with him in various parts of the country. Wherever we were, with business insiders, government officials, community leaders, philanthropists, or taxi drivers, he figured out natural ways to graciously and effectively share Christ. We spent hours discussing the atmosphere in a crisis, the immense demands on a leader's time, the pressures from all sides, the growing threat and danger of nuclear war, the degeneration of Western civilization. They thought it was bad back then. And I asked, how in the midst of all this chaos do you maintain your own sense of values and priorities, of what is right and wrong? How do you find meaningful solutions for the chaotic, the chaotic times in which we live? Then he said, I'll never forget his answer. Going over to his still unpacked suitcase, he ever so carefully took out a book. The pages were loose. Some fell out. It was beat up, worn, and it looked terrible. Yet he handled it so carefully and carried it like it was the greatest of all treasures. As he sat down, I could tell that the beat up old book was his Bible. I asked if I could hold it, and as I turned to page after page in the Old and the New Testaments, there was hardly any more room on any page for any more writing. Every page was well-worn and obviously well-read and studied. I asked him how often he had to get a new Bible, thinking that the Bible on my lap had to be at least 20 years old. He replied, about every two years. At 70 years of age, wearing out a Bible every two years by studying it. I knew what his answer would be to my original question. He simply said, you must get to know the author of this book and put it in, into practice everything he tells you to do. As a college student, he established his priorities, Drew uh, concludes, and down through the years, his first priority, get this, has been to begin each day with a minimum of two hours with God and his words, no exceptions permitted ever. If he had time, you have time. And I do too. It's like Spurgeon said, you probably heard this, a Bible that's falling apart generally belongs to someone who isn't. <laughs> This kind of long-term saturation happens in, in the prayer closet, in small groups, in Sunday schools, and in the pulpit. Though these days you'll see less and less of any of those, especially in the pulpit, where you're less and less likely to get the meat of God's word. It's watered-down infant formula, and we got a whole bunch of fat baby Christians out there. People are questioning the efficacy of preaching these days. What good does it do? I mean, I can't remember a, a single sermon that I've listened to. They'll say, well, nothing new under the sun. They've been saying that for centuries. In fact, it's like the letter the British Weekly published years ago. Here's the letter. Dear sirs, it seems ministers feel their sermons are very important and spend a great deal of time preparing them. At least ministers used to do that. I've been attending church quite regularly for 30 years, and I've probably heard 3,000 of them. To my consternation, I discovered I cannot remember a single sermon. I wonder if a minister's time might be more profitably be spent on something else. Well, for weeks, there was a storm of editorial responses, and finally, it was all ended by this one letter. Dear sir, I've been married for 30 years. During that time, I have eaten, I calculated, 32,850 meals. Mostly my wife's cooking. Suddenly, I've discovered I cannot remember a, a, the menu of a single meal. And yet, I have the distinct impression that without them, I would have starved to death long ago. A lot of starving Christians out there. What's the secret of transformation? One, it's a long-term process of saturation. And if that's what you want, again, you've come to the right church. So the core of our mission, we seek to know and show the enduring truth and love of Jesus Christ, biblically grounded. But equally, just as importantly, it's a short-term process of selection. It has to do with saturating our minds, but equally with selecting 
our thoughts. It's about saturating your mind year after year and selecting, again, your thoughts moment by moment. If all you do is fill your mind without working on your thoughts, you know, if you just focus on understanding the Bible intellectually, doctrinally, without letting God's word impact what you're actually thinking personally, privately, that is what you're actually thinking, you know, about your boss or your husband or your wife before you lose it, or someone who's not your wife maybe, or what you're thinking about your future or yourself or whatever, if it doesn't impact your actual thinking, you're not going to be transformed in your actual living. And how do you do that? Well, here's one of many ways. Maybe it'll trigger something in you and confirm what you're doing or give you an idea of what you could be doing. Back to the story I began with. Back in the 70s, I was really struggling with all that I had told you about at the beginning, with the fear that I told you about, the fear of people. And, uh, and I would, when I'd feel like running from a relationship, and I'd be hurting people because they wanted to get to know me better, and I wouldn't let them. And when the impulse came to bolt from a relationship because it was getting too close for comfort, and I was afraid of getting hurt, what what, what what am I going to do? The Spirit of God was convicting me. Well, as a result of a lot of reading and some counseling that started with my mother, and then I went to see a couple of Christ, good Christian counselors, based on Romans 12 2, I learned to go into what I called an emergency response mode. As in ER. First, expose. Expose the thinking that's behind the feeling. And then second, R, replace it. Replace it with the truth. E-R, expose, replace. We tend to be controlled by our feelings as though they're the problem, but really they're not. No, the real problem is the thinking that fuels the feeling. Every bad feeling has some bad thinking under it that's causing it. So what was the thinking that needed to be exposed? It was... Look out, you're, you're, you're going to get hurt again, and your survival depends on people not hurting you. You're only safe if you're alone, so you're, you need to be out of here. Took me years to uncover that thought. And several godly counselors, that's how I was acting, but I was clueless about how I was thinking. So deceptive is the heart. Which is why David said, what we need to say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious, what? Thoughts at the core of who I am. I'm clueless. I'm just an autopilot with my feelings. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any way of pain within me from my past or whatever. And on that basis alone, having exposed these things, then you can lead me in the everlasting way. With, once my thoughts are right, then my walk will be right. My own way of pain produced uh, an anxious thought rather than, and a rather selfish way of thinking that was like a lie from the pit of hell. It was killing me. Look out, you're going to get hurt again. Your survival depends on people not hurting you. And so you're only safe when you're alone. Don't love them, leave them. But God's word is alive and sharp and powerful to judge such thoughts and intentions as we're told. And judges them it does. And their lies because God's word tell me that, tells me that my survival depends on one person and one person only. And that is the God who will never leave me nor forsake me. One of the arsenal verses that I memorize, Isaiah 41.10. Uh, he'll never leave me nor forsake me so that I may boldly say, the Lord is my help and I will not fear what men shall do unto me. Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. The Lord is my rock, Psalm 18, I love this, and my fortress, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my, my shield the, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And it became really real through the truth. You, you go into emergency response mode rather than just, you know, laying there like the helpless victim of your feelings, letting your mind get away with murder. 
It was only when I stopped rolling over and playing dead and started to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. It was only when I learned to E, expose the lie, and R, replace it with the truth, that I was more and more incrementally but inexorably transformed by the renewing of my mind. And now, 40 years later, I told you it's a long-term process, right? We're not always talking about immediate gratification here. How un-American. But in that area anyway, I've been transformed in my thinking through the power of God's word. And does he have his ironies or what? To give me a calling where I'm with people all the time. And I love it. For the most part. (laughs) Because this works in real life through the power of his word. Yes, incrementally, but inexorably. But you can rest assured that there are many other areas that, of course, I just talked to Julie that I'm still working on because to this day, if you're anything like me, it's so easy for something very ugly to build up on the inside and you're hardly aware of it. I call it dirty thinking, as in keep your lousy jack. You know, so often we end up connecting the dots in all the wrong ways with people, not just with ourselves, but with people. And we end up with these straw men and women that we're angry at who bear little resemblance to the real person. Or maybe they've become totally different persons and we're still angry with them as though they're like they were 40 years ago. We draw a completely distorted picture of people's intentions and motives, one that can ruin a relationship and they're clueless. We do this with people and situations and problems where we're controlled by lies rather than by the truth, by fear rather than faith. And so we always need to be on the alert with an emergency response strategy that shows no mercy. You know, a double-barreled response, you might say, as an E double R. That's what it had to become for me. Not just expose and replace, but expose and reject and replace. That's the middle step that's just as important. You expose, reject, and then replace those thoughts. Or as Paul says, you crucify the flesh with its thoughts and desires. Whenever they rear their ugly heads, lustful thoughts, whatever it is for you, bitter thoughts, fearful thoughts, judgmental thoughts, prideful thoughts, anxious thoughts, angry thoughts, you don't coddle them, you crucify them. As they say, sometimes you can't help you know, it's like what they say of, our, of our, our, our eyes. Sometimes you can't help the first look, but you can't help the second look. And it's the same with our thoughts. Don't give it a second thought. You put them to death by refusing to entertain them because they're, 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 they're suicide bombs. And all you got to do is to think about them, to trigger them, so you renounce and reject them. That's crucify. That's the image scripture uses. Lest they crucify you. E-R-R-R. And whatever you do, don't give up. Because if you're anything like me, some of them are pretty entrenched in your life and they're going to keep coming back. And you will have to keep beating them back. A thousand times, maybe 10,000 times. But in the end, they will die down if you stand guard. We're talking about the law of the harvest here. It's like Paul says in Galatians 6, 8, he who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption. And the verb is, you're going to keep reaping corruption because you've sowed so long in that direction. Even if you stop sowing that way, you'll continue to reap what you've sown for so long. And so don't give up. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit increasingly reap eternal life, the, the eternal way of his word and his will through you. So, hang in there. It's like the famous quote, so a thought. Remember that one? So a thought, this is the scriptural teaching, and you'll reap an act. So an act, and you'll reap a habit. So a habit, and you'll reap a character. 
Sow a character and you'll reap a destiny. And so the ultimate application of Romans 12, 2 is this. It's Philippians 4, 8. As you replace dirty thinking, again, it's all over scripture and here too, is to replace dirty thinking with whatsoever is true, whatsoever is honorable, whatsoever is right, whatsoever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute. If there is any excellence in anything worthy of praise, let your minds dwell on these things, not on all those other things. Let me conclude with this. If if you're trying to turn around a business or even a church, where do you start? Well, any good consultant will tell you that you've got to start with the management, right? And the same is true for the management of our lives. So often we let our minds get away with murder and then we blame You know, our bodies, our flesh, our emotions, our families, our friends, our situations. We blame anything and everything and everybody when really there's something wrong with upper management, with master control. If you're trying to turn around a life, you need to start with master control. That's the scripture's teaching. And the first thing, as most of you know, is you get some new management in there, some new life. You need to become a Christian. You need to put, get Christ in there and put him on the driver's seat of your life. And then you get it out of autopilot by the power of the spirit of Christ and the truth of Christ who is in you. You start cultivating the mind of Christ by saturating yourself in the word of Christ and by taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's sanctification. If in this way, you're deeply reformed in your mind, slowly but surely, you will be richly transformed in your life. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, as the worship leaders come forward. Therefore, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove... What is the will of God? That which is good and acceptable and perfect. And ultimately, it's the one who is the truth that needs to be our vision. And it all comes from that. So let's all stand.